welcome to each of you. We're going to travel together now, and I need to give you a little bit of forewarning. This journey that we're going to take is not pleasant. This will be the first, last, and only time that we'll have such a travelogue, but it's directly related to the subject matter we need to share a few moments later. So if you will, please relax and fasten your seatbelts, and we shall go to Dachau. We leave from the city of Munich, Germany, and take the side rail only just 11 miles, and we arrive at the village of Dachau. It was one of the extermination camps of the Third Reich. It was one of the torture chambers, one of the gas chambers, and continues to be a very tragic reminder. We got off the train and went across from the depot to buy some fruit for breakfast. And we asked the lady at the fruit stand, how from here may we find the prison camp of Dachau? And she said, next year stay. I don't understand. No English. But she'd understood perfectly when we asked her how much are the bananas. <laughs> but in any event, we explained we're not here to try to, to be judgmental or to be unkind, but we're here only in the hope that this kind of thing will never happen again. And I told her my name, and she said, well, you're surely not Italian. All right, she said, welcome, you German. Uh, she said, take bus number seven to the last stop, and that we did. And in just a few moments, we were at the prison camp of Dachau. As soon as we got off the bus, we could see that it was a place of maximum security. There was an outer wall of concrete. There was an inner wall of concertina wire. And inside of that still, there was a moat filled with razor wire. And every hundred yards, there was a machine gun tower with a guard waiting for someone to come near the wall so he could use that as an excuse to gun them down. There's a signboard from which we're going to get our directions, and then we're going to move out into the camp proper. I want to begin now by telling you that you're going to be seeing three different kinds of pictures. You're going to see colored pictures like these that we shot with our cameras of the camp as it is today. And then you're going to be seeing some black and white pictures. Those are pictures of pictures that hang in the museum wall, pictures that were taken during the time the camp was used as an extermination camp. And then the third type of picture will be colored, but you'll immediately see the coloration is different. Those colors were furnished me by our war department when I returned from this journey and wrote them and asked them if they would share with me some pictures and that they did. This whole camp was built by forced labor. The majority were Jewish, of course, but there were quite a few Christians who suffered for their faith during this time. Corey Ten Boom, you may remember, and her sister and several other Christians were incarcerated, and many of her family members died in one of these camps. But in any event, the prisoners were required to dig up the soil and move it here and there in wheelbarrows and in bushel baskets, and then they were put to work rolling down the soil and compacting it. They were harnessed to great iron rollers that were filled with water, and they worked like draft animals. And when the earth was smoothed and solidified, then they were put to work digging the trenches and by hand mixing concrete for the footings and foundations and then building the buildings. Those concrete foundations are all that remain of the old barracks of the time that this was in use. In the foreground, you'll see there a building. That is um, today the museum, and that's where we shot a lot of pictures. That was the command center at the time this place was in use. Now, this obviously is one of the pictures furnished by the War Department. This is life as it was when it was used as an extermination camp, and you see lots of Jews here, prisoners in the foreground. They've not been here so, too terribly long. We know that because they're wearing their street clothing, and they still have some flesh on their bones, and then in the background, you see the barracks. There are some windows, but very few of the windows have glass in them, and they lived in conditions we wouldn't keep animals in, spring, summer, winter, fall, and always. Every morning, there was roll call, not to see if any had escaped, but rather to see who had survived the night. And after you'd been here a few months, that really was the miracle. And all across Europe, the propaganda machinery of the Third Reich 
was stirring up hatred against people of color. If you know of someone with dark skin and dark eyes and dark hair, please tell us where they are, who they are, so we may relocate them. And a similar thing was happening down in Italy under Mussolini. Now this black and white picture is a picture of an original that was made in 1820. It's a picture of burning books. In the very center of that picture, you find a bonfire, and they're burning Jewish books. And in 1820, poet Heinrich Hein was more prophet than poet when he said of this, this is but a prelude. Where books are burned, humans will be burned in the end. And 120 plus years later, that's exactly what was happening. Across Europe, the officers of the Third Reich of the German army were gathering up men, the younger men, the more able-bodied, those who were able to work, and telling them they were going to relocate you. We're going to take you to a place where there are better jobs and better living conditions, and soon we'll send the wife and the kids. And with that promise in mind, they were marched off to the railheads, and there at gunpoint they were forced into cattle cars, stand, standing up, no provision made for their physical needs, no restroom facility. They were packed in, standing up, and then when not room for one more was available, they shut the door and it was locked, and they traveled that way from four to ten days. When one had to relieve himself or herself, they were passed head over, head over head to a corner, and that was the best that they were able to do. After the young men were gone, then the old and the infirm and the women and children at gunpoint were rounded up, and it was a part of the plan of Hitler to divide and conquer, to send dad to Auschwitz and mom to Buchenwald and maybe the kids to Dachau. You can imagine those horrors. Here's a man in the camp who sat down for lunch. He's put down his pick, and he has in his hand a bowl, and in that bowl, there's a little warm water in which some rice has been boiled. If he's very lucky, there may still be a kernel of rice or two. And this man has been here for a while, as you obviously are able to see. And so also his friends in the background. All kinds of experimentation was done. If you wanted to know how long a German Air Force pilot or Luftwaffe Luftwaffe pilot could survive if he was shot down over the waters of the North Sea. You just take a Jew and put him in the uniform of the pilot, put him in a tank of ice water, and see how long he survives and watch what he goes through before he dies. If you want to know how nerve gas works, you just take a Jew and put him in the tank and open the gas and again watch the various stages of horror until finally the release of death comes. If you want to know how the human brain works, unbelievable. This is the interrogation room. If it was felt that some prisoner was withholding information about a brother or an uncle or someone else, he was brought here and interrogated. And if he was not forthcoming, then that big mallet was used on his hands, knuckles, and his knees and elbows. And if still he wouldn't tell, then he was hanged to death with his arms tied behind him and his body suspended from those tied arms. Here we see out in the woods some men who are hanged to death in exactly that way. A medical doctor down in Georgia described to me that when one is hung in that way, he dies of drowning. For you cannot exhale deeply enough to get the fluid from your lungs and you drown in your own body fluids. When a train load of prisoners would come in, their decent street clothing was taken from them to give to the German people, and the filthy old rags from those who'd already been through the system were given to them. And this then was the shower room. After they were here for months or weeks perhaps only, they were told, we're going to give you a nice shower. We're going to give you then a clean change of clothing. They were stripped naked, men, women, and children, and all marched together inside and told, stand right beneath the shower heads. And when the place was packed, then the door was closed and bolted shut and sealed. The valves opened and poison gas came and they died en masse. 
Next door was the powerhouse for the prison camp. It is also known as the crematorium today, for inside were gas-fired furnaces, and they accommodated those furnaces with steel stretchers that could be slid back, and two or three emaciated bodies strapped to them and then shoved back into the flame. And in just a few moments, there were a few charred remains left only. The Allies were getting near and near and near by 1945, and it was quite obvious that they were not going to be able to hide all of the evidence by burning the bodies in the furnaces. And so they began with great earth movers and bulldozers to dig mass graves. And perhaps you've seen the newsreels of those starved, emaciated bodies thrown over like so much cordwood into the graves and then buried under. I have talked to servicemen, two at least, who helped to liberate this camp. They, by the way, were paratroopers. And they dropped in, and these are among the things they found. And they both told me that they were unable to eat for weeks and weeks and unable still to sleep without, without disturbed sleep, without um, nightmares and flashbacks, as you can imagine. You know, ladies and gentlemen, if this kind of thing had happened in some remote corner of the world, if this atrocity had happened in some dark jungle or some remote mountaintop of ignorance, we could have perhaps better understood it. But it did not happen in the midst of paganism or in some godless crisis society. Rather, this happened in Lutherland. This happened at the birthplace of the Reformation. Still today, ladies and gentlemen, people are dying for their faith. It was said that in the last five years, more Christians have died for their faith than died during the first hundred years of Christianity under the persecutions of Nero, Hadrian, and Diocletian. And so this kind of thing is still going on. How long? Every human heartache casts a shadow upon the heart of God. If God is all-powerful, as we believe He is, why does He do this? And if He doesn't do it, why then does He step back and allow it? If He is omniscient, that means all-knowing, why didn't He make a plan to prevent all of it? God is to blame. Tonight, during the lecture, I stand as God's attorney. I stand tonight in defense of the character of God. I want to thank you for traveling with me. Just this morning, I was asked this question. Lyle, do you believe that God is punishing America for her sins, for her disregard of God's law, for her immorality, adultery, incest, and all of the rest? Do you believe that the collapse of the towers on 9-11 were the result of God's punishing the children of earth? Do you believe that the tsunamis out in the Far East were part of, of God's retribution upon a sinful mankind? And what about Katrina? And what about this morning's news of the terrible tornadoes that have gone through Atlanta? It seems hardly a day goes by except there is some horror, either man-made, murder, mayhem, rape, riot, or some natural disaster that the insurance companies often like to refer to as the act of God. Seems somehow God continuously is blamed for that which He did not do and really had little, if anything at all, to do with. I want you now to open your Bibles to our first scripture. It's Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. Revelation chapter 12, beginning with verse 7. And I hope that you A students have something to write upon because we're going to be covering a lot of scriptures without time to read every single verse. Revelation 12, 7 and following, There was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels, and the dragon prevailed not, neither was his place found anymore in heaven. 
And the great dragon was kicked out. The old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into this earth, and so also were his angels kicked out with him. My subject for this evening, God and human suffering. Within hours after our son Terry died, Peggy and I were asked, do you blame God? Do you feel that God is responsible? Are you angry somehow with God? And I know that folks who deal with grief counseling and, and all of this kind of thing are well intended. And, uh, and I don't throw stones at psychologists or psychiatrists, but I do sometimes feel like the Australian, you know, who asked, what is a psychiatrist? They said, well, that's someone that you pay to talk to. And he said, well, what's the matter? Ain't you got no mates? Huh? <laughs> Did I blame God when my boy died? No, no. Did I see God allowing evil? Not really, no. Did I see terror? No. I'll tell you what I was manifested to both Peggy and me. I saw in my neighbors and in my friends and in my relatives the love of God. That's what most impressed me. Not evil, but so very, very much good. And I've been asked, how can God be so bad? And my question is, how can God to we who turn our backs on him so often be so very, very good? I want to read something to you because it was very helpful to me when we had our loss and continues to be. You listen now. This is a quotation from an article entitled America's Superpower Prophecy. Listen now. The cross of Calvary, while it declares the law to be immutable, proclaims to the universe that the wages of sin is death. In the Savior's expiring cry, it is finished, the death knell of Satan was rung. The great controversy which has so long been in progress was then decided, and the final eradication of evil was made certain. The Son of God passed through the portals of the tomb that through death he might destroy him that has the power now over death, and that is the devil. And that last quotation of course is from Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 it is the devil who now has the power over death and those kinds of things and so we don't blame God when we see tragedy and when we know heartache a lady ministered to me really unknowingly when our boy died I've mentioned it before but might again momentarily that when this happened Peggy and I had just opened meetings over just south of Olympia, Washington, 10 miles. I missed two nights of meeting because of the death of our son, but I hurried back. And on my first night back, a lady gave to me a CD of the hymns of Elvis Presley. Many, many most of them I think I'd heard before, but there was one that while I'd heard it from others, prior. I'd never heard it from Elvis. I knew that it had been written and sung and recorded by Larry Gatlin, but I didn't know Elvis had immortalized it. It's entitled, Help Me, and I want to read to you just a few of the words. Lord, help me walk another mile, just one more mile. You know I'm tired of walking all alone. And Lord, help me smile another smile, just one more smile. For you know that I can't make it on my own. I never thought I needed help before. Thought that I could get by by myself. But now I know I just can't take it anymore. So with a humble heart and on bended knee, I'm begging you. Lord, help me. Come down from your throne to me, Lord, just to me. I need to feel the touch of your scarred hands. Remove the chains of darkness and let me see, Lord. Let me see just where I fit in your master plan. I never thought I needed help before. I thought that I could get by by myself. But now I know I just can't take it anymore. So with a humble heart, on bended knees, I'm begging you, please help me. 
I thought about our suffering and then I've compared it with that of others. And I want to share with you now a story of a few days in a preacher's life. You think as to whether or not it relates to us or, or to your own problems. Listen now. Over along our coast, a pastor was called quickly to the hospital because there was a woman there whose, heart, whose husband rather had suffered a terrible heart attack. He went there to pray with her and, and went to visit the husband. And it seemed that he was getting better when they found in his neck a cancerous tumor. His wife stayed by his bedside day after day after day. But after more than a week, she collapsed with a perforated and bleeding ulcer. And then she got pneumonia. And while she was suffering from the pneumonia in the same hospital, her husband died. And another hospital nearby was her daughter suffering with a kidney infection. And this lady, as you might well guess, asked, Why is God punishing us? What have we done? And I shall never forget when I first heard this question asked by parents of a little baby girl. I was only just weeks into my ministry over in central Idaho. We went on a camp out, did our church. We camped on the banks of the Snake River, still in the timber on the Idaho side. And there came to our camp out a young couple by the name of Jack and Penny Delano. They had with them a beautiful little five-year-old daughter, blonde hair, blue eyes. And I learned during those few hours that we spent together that they had just moved up from the Bay Area of California. An uncle had helped them to move, had driven their furniture up in a rental truck, helped them unload it and settle in their new home in Cambridge, Idaho. And when he backed the truck away to return it to California, he backed over their two-year-old blonde-headed baby girl. And Jack and Penny were asking that age-old question, why? Why? If there is a God, why do the innocent suffer? Why my baby? Why? Why? Sometimes there comes a larger question. God, what are you doing? And sometimes we hear from Scripture those verses, Deuteronomy 6. Here's one, Deuteronomy 6, 24. It raises a question. God says, what I do is always for your good. That's what Moses said. What God does is always for my good. Oh, really now? Sometimes we wonder. Romans chapter 8, 28. This one's more familiar to us, of course. All things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to His uh, calling. And so there then comes the question, who is responsible? And we found the answer in our first scripture, didn't we? There was war in heaven. When I first heard this, it was hard for me to imagine. War may be on some other planet, maybe out on Pluto, but surely not in heaven. No, there was. There was an angel honored above all of the others, given position higher above all of the others, more handsome than all of the others, and had a wonderful voice, says the old prophet. But he was not satisfied with what he had. He wanted more. He wanted to create. He wanted to be like God. He wanted, says the Bible, to sit on a throne. I also will sit. Created beings cannot create. And so God called him in and said to him, Lucifer, you're not my equal, nor are you Christ's equal. The Bible says about Christ that when he finished his work here, he went back to heaven and he was sat down. He was among equals. He sits on a throne. He is the creator of this planet. The Bible is abundantly clear about that. But this angel, Lucifer, wanted to create. It's my turn. I have the ambition. I have the ability. Let me. And God called him in and talked to him and said, no, put it out of your mind. Deny yourself this idea. You cannot create. I've not denied you anything. You're nearest to the throne. You're one of the covering cherubs. And you have this wonderful voice. And you are handsome beyond description. But you cannot create. You cannot sit on the throne. You're not my equal. You're not equal to to Jesus and instead of doing what God had asked humbling himself the devil threw a tantrum and began a whispering campaign amongst his buddies and as we mentioned this morning he is the great divider and one-third of the angels joined him in his rebellion and it turned into open war in the streets of gold imagine that Jesus and God the Father of course always are victorious and so the devil was kicked out and he transferred the struggle, the controversy to planet Earth. For you see, the controversy had originally started over 
the creation of planet earth our lord jesus is about to hang this one this beautiful orb in that vacant space there and the devil said it's my turn i want to do it and god said no and so he said all right i'll show you then i'll fix your newly created planet that you wouldn't let me make and he came here to planet earth and the war transferred and the devil turned him the angel rather that was uh, was perfect in every way was transformed transferred into a devil the apostle paul you may or may not remember said i saw satan fall from heaven as an angel of light an angel of light well there comes then that question still is god now punishing us for our sins and it comes again and again and again and by the way when the twin towers fell and when the terrible storms katrina and edna and the others hit the southern coast there were televangelists whose names we'll not use tonight who were saying we're paying now this is the retribution of god god is coming down on us because we've turned our back we've taken the bible and the ten commandments out of schools and out of courtrooms and now god is giving it to us he's given us what we deserve and there is in the news today even if you've been watching the last two or three days another man um, in a church in chicago who's becoming very infamous right now for preaching the very same kind of an idea and he's really blaming god you know the real phrase don't you that's been used in the last two or three days is god doing this is god causing human suffering no 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 and even the devils and those who are behind the human suffering and tragedy know it very well and so i'm going to refer us to some verses i want us to read them together matthew 8 matthew chapter 8 and i want us to read verses 28 and 29 matthew 8 verses 28 and 29 and this I find most comforting, most encouraging. By the way, I've preached a sermon like this many, many, many times, but I have never quite approached it in this way for the simple reason that I never quite understood it like this until recently myself. And I hope it'll be encouraging to some of you. Matthew 8, beginning to read at the 28th verse. Matthew 8, 28 and 29. When Jesus had gone over into the other side of the lake and over to the country of the Gadarenes, there met him two men who were demon-possessed. They came out from amongst the tombs, and they were exceedingly fierce and wanted that no man should pass by that way. And when they saw Jesus, they cried out to him, and they said, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Are you come here to... Now tell me what it says next are you come here to torment us come on before the time do you see the theology here are you come to bring torment to us now are you no torment is to come at the end of all judgment and even demons those demon possessed knew it are you come to torment us ahead of time before the time no no the time for punishment is not yet i want us now to go together to job chapter 21 Job and then the Psalms and the Proverbs, chapter 21, and we shall read at verse 30. Job 21 and verse 30. Here it says, The wicked, that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction, that they shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. And when is the punishment? At the end at the time of destruction now there is a scripture almost exactly like that to be found in second peter and so i want you to turn with me there if you will please only just for a moment second peter carries on the theme in chapter 3 and verse 7 to peter chapter 3 and verse 7 but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men and so it is abundantly clear, both Old and New Testaments, that this day and age is not the time for punishment, but that rather that is still in the future. Now listen to me and follow this logic or lack thereof as you choose. If God were causing punishment, 
if God was behind the dropping of the Twin Towers, if God brought the tsunami out in the Far East, if God brought Katrina to destroy the homes and the lives of so many hundreds and hundreds of people, wouldn't it be only just the wicked who were suffering? If God is punishing wickedness, wouldn't it just fall upon the wicked? But the righteous suffer as well. And oftentimes it seems to me and a lot of other folks that the righteous suffer more intensely than do the wicked. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 2, True and righteous are thy judgments, O Lord. And there are a number of other places in the Bible, I'm going to give you some references, where it is abundantly clear that now the wicked are the ones that are really prospering. They're, to the large degree, the ones that are getting wealthy because they have no conscience and they're willing to cheat and steal and lie and do whatever it takes to get ahead. They'll walk on the back of any honest man to get to the top of the heap. Psalm 73 and verse 3. Here, Psalm 73, verse 3. David said, I was jealous of the prosperity of the wicked. All right? And then in Psalm 73, verse 12, he said, the ungodly are the ones who now prosper. The ungodly prosper. And then in Psalm 73, verse 17, he said, I didn't understand why the wicked were suffering, uh, were prospering rather, and God's children were so terribly suffering until I went and studied the sanctuary. And there's another good reason, my dears, for a studying and loving the sanctuary service. He said, I began to understand why good people suffer and why wicked people prosper when I studied God's sanctuary. I understood then the prosperity of the wicked. In the time of Christ and for a long while before, Jewish people believed that if a man were sick, that was a result of God's punishment. If a man is both sick and diseased, God really dislikes that person, really despises him. And the more sick he is, the, the poorer he is, the greater his disease, the more God is showing his uh, his disrespect and, and really his distaste for those kinds of people. The disciples, because of their Jewish background, believed the very same kind of a thing. In John chapter 9 and the first three verses, they express that idea, and we want to read it together now, please. John's Gospel, chapter 9 and the first three verses. Chapter 9 of St. John, verses 1, 2, and 3. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who'd been blind from birth, and the disciples said to him, Master, who sinned? Was it this man, or was it his parents, the cause of his being born blind? And Jesus said, Neither this man nor his parents are to blame, but rather the works of God be made manifest. And so here we see that very same idea very prevalent amongst the disciples of Jesus. In Luke chapter 13, and we, ought to, we have the time, let's turn there as well. Luke 13, and we're going to notice the first five verses. This, by the way, is in the context of the belief of the Pharisees. And this is the way it reads. Luke 13, beginning with verse 1. There were present at that season some of those who told him of Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus, and, and by the way, it's talking about believers in Jesus, folks who'd been martyred for their faith in God and Christ. In verse 2, it says, Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that the Galileans were sinners greater than the others of Galilee? My, my people, were they greater sinners than other Galileans because they suffered so? And then in verse 3, he says, I tell you, no, that's not right. But except you repent, you'll suffer, you'll perish likewise. And then he goes on. Were those 18 folks upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and died, were they greater sinners, sinners above all that live in and around Jerusalem? No, he says, no. God is not punishing his saints, but rather this is the result of the old enemy who brings disease and all of the rest, the pain and the suffering and the death. Would a righteous God, now listen carefully, would a righteous and holy God cripple some little boy or little girl in order to punish his dad? Of course not. 
Of course not. We, parents, wouldn't react in such a way, and certainly God wouldn't. We human judges wouldn't react in that way. Job chapter 4 and verse 17, it says there, shall mortal man be more just than God? And the answer, of course, is no. That's a rhetorical question. Of course not. God wouldn't cause harm to, to someone just to get revenge on his dad or, or upon someone else who was doing wrong. When the twin towers fell, they fell on a lot of innocent folks. You see? And God wasn't behind it at all. You remember the story of Job. Job loved and served God so faithfully, and the devil said, you let me at him. The only reason he serves you is that you give him everything. He has everything going his way. Look at his wealth, and look how prosperous are his children, and how happy are they all. He serves you because you give him everything. And God said, it's not so. And the devil said, you let me at him. I'll prove to you, he'll curse you. And God said, all right, Satan, you may do anything to him. You can take the houses and the land and the family and all the rest, but you can't take his life. There I draw the line. And so you remember, he lost the ranch and the cattle, and he lost his kids, and then he had this terrible disease. It covered from the top of his head to the sole of his feet like superating wounds, someone said, or terrible boils. And in verse 12 of Job chapter 1, the Lord said unto Satan, and this is after the devil has tested him, and, and Job has remained faithful. The Lord said unto Satan, all that Job has is in your power, and he is in your hands. You see? The devil is behind it. Now, if sickness, disease, heartache was as a result of the judgments of God, what right would a Christian have to open a hospital? What right would a Christian nurse have to go and minister to the sick? What right would a Christian doctor have to help those in the surgery room or to dispense medicine for their better health? What right would anyone have to meddle in the punishment of God? Oh, God has been grossly misrepresented all down through the ages. Now, we must be very careful to point out that we may have we have opportunity to have, and too often times we take advantage of the opportunity, the, the ability, that's the best way to say it, I guess, the ability to help the devil out. And I'm going to read you some scriptures in that regard. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Here the apostle Paul says, Every man that strives for the mastery is what? lives a profligate, profligate life and goes out and, and eats and drinks and parties all day and all night long. No, every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Are you overworking? You know, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Am I overeating? Am I not exercising enough? Am I being intemperate? Temperance is the law of life and health. And we've had so many, many of late illustrations of those who live the other kind of a life and then pay with an early death. And we could mention names not to be in judgment of their souls, but I think immediately of John Belushi who snorted cocaine and injected all kinds of things and, and, and ate like there would never be another meal. And John Candy was another and Chris Farley still another. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, there God through the apostle Paul said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Not always in this life. We're all not always going to, to reap the harvest in this life. But one day, one day, someone in response to the move amongst politicians these days to guarantee and provide total health and health and medical insurance to all Americans, cradle to the grave, womb to the tomb, infants to, to the very end of the old man's life said this and you ask yourself if it makes sense why is it that we spend our money when we're young to ruin our health and when we're older we expect others with their tax dollars to spend those hard-earned dollars in order to help us try and get our health back uh -huh. Proverbs 6 verses 27 and 28 there God asks another rhetorical question. Can a man take fire into his bosom? 
And as soon as I read that, I was thinking, of course, about tobacco and smoking. Can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be burned? And the answer, of course, is no. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We cannot continuously disobey God openly and flagrantly and expect to walk away unscathed. And John Greenleaf Whittier said it in these words, We shape ourselves the joy or fear of which the coming life is made. We fill our future's atmosphere with sunshine or with shade. The tissue of the life to be we weave with colors of our own. In the field of destiny, we reap as we have sown. And that's what God said as well. And someone said to me not long ago, well, I'm not sure I agree with you in that regard. For I read not very long ago, whom God loves, he chastens. Now, you've heard it as well, haven't you? Whomever God loves, he chastens with the ideas he beats up on them. He gives them a really hard spanking with a leather strap. Well... I did some word study in that area, and I don't want to come off ever as a biblical language scholar. I am not. I do know how to use the tools and do the research. And I discovered that word that in the King James is translated chasten. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, is better understood to mean he instructs and he educates. How about that? Whomever the Lord loves, he instructs and he educates. God allows human suffering but he's not the designer of it he's not the originator of it and he certainly does not cause it god has promised to be with us during the heartache and during the difficult time and i think i've said to you before i don't understand i can't understand how folks without faith can walk away from the fresh grave of their loved one, their child, their spouse. I don't know how they survive. I don't know. And I'm so thankful to God for the faith that he's given to Peggy and me and for the hope for the future. And we know we're all going to be together again. And we've clung, Peggy and I, and memorized once again those promises of God. I won't allow you to be suffer above what you're able to bear I won't allow that. My grace, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you. And I've claimed that promise day after day after day. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 and verse, 15, 4, verse 13. Philippians 4, 13. And in Philippians 4, 19, same passage, few verses down. My God will supply all of your needs. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 9 favorite promise of mine lately affliction and suffering shall not arise the second time that's good news isn't it that is such wonderful good news to those that are suffering pain loss heartache disease separation I know not where his islands lift their fronded palms in air I only know I cannot drift beyond his love and care. On our second night together, I shared with you in conclusion a little story, a true story. I'm going to repeat it tonight. There was a lady who was senior, nearing death and knew it, a very faithful Christian lady, and she called her pastor over and she said, with the legal authorities, I have made my will. And now I want with you, Pastor, to plan my funeral. I've been to so many, she said, and it is traditional that the one who lies in the casket lies with hands folded over the chest. Not me, Pastor. Not me. No, she said, in my left hand, I want to be holding my Bible. And in my right hand, I want to be holding a kitchen fork and I'm sure the preachers jaw dropped what do you mean I can understand you're wanting your Bible buried with you what do you mean you want to be holding your fork and the lady said pastor one of the things I love about the fellowship at church 
uh, the dinners. One of the things I really look forward to are the dinners. And, and we have such wonderful dinners, but I always enjoy it most when they're cleaning up the tables. Someone leans over to me and says, hang on to your fork. <laughs> For I know something better is coming. I know the dessert will soon be served. And so again, I say to all of you, and to my own heart, and to Peggy's, and our kids, hang on to your fork. Now let's pray. Forgive us, Lord, if ever we have blamed you for the pain and the sorrow and the death and the disease. We know that you originally planned for life that was full and abundant and healthful. We know that our Lord Jesus promised, I am come that you might have the abundant life. But so often we've turned away from your lifestyle, from your example, from your diet. So oftentimes we've lived the life of the prodigal. So oftentimes we've taken in that which is for our own destruction. Forgive us. Make us better tomorrow than we are today. Strengthen our weaknesses. Help us follow better our strengths. In the meantime, give us the courage as we hang on to our forks. In Jesus' name, we praise you and thank you always. Amen. And I'm going to begin with a question that was um, just handed to me a little bit ago. Does the Bible call our Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit all God? And the answer to that is yes. The Bible does refer to the Holy Father and the Holy Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit all as God. Now, one night here, I took only just a few minutes to try to help one or two understand the God family. And I remember saying that the name God is the family name, and I likened it to our family name, Albrecht. There is Lyle, there is Peggy, there is our son Troy and our daughter Tammy, and we're different, and yet we're very alike in many ways, but we share a common family name. God is the family name in the Bible, and it's made up of three members of the family, God, whom we now refer to as the Holy Father, God, whom we now refer to as the Son, the Holy Son, and God, whom we refer to as the Holy Spirit. Different, distinct people. When Jesus was here on earth, John chapter 17, among other places, he prayed, Our Father, which art in heaven. You see? And the Holy Spirit, in the book of Acts, you read, he can be lied to. You remember Ananias and Sapphira? You know, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. It's different from the Holy Father, from Jesus, but, but one in purpose and one in, uh, in their outreach, and one in their desire for salvation for everybody. They have different jobs to do. When Jesus was here on earth, he was a healer, he was a teacher, he was an example, he discipled, that means he taught, and then he apostled, that means he sent out his students to share what he had taught. Shortly before he ascended, and you find this in John chapters 13, 14, 15, he said to his disciples, I won't leave you helpless, I won't leave you in a jam, I won't leave you comfortless, but I will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. I have had folks who on occasion have said to me, I know the Bible says this. It may be about what happens at death. It may be about how to eat. It may be about the Sabbath and which day to worship upon. But I've had several who said to me during my 37 years of ministry, I know that that's what it says in the Bible, but... And by the way, everything after the but leads us into trouble generally. But the Holy Spirit 
hasn't impressed me that it's important for me. But the Holy Spirit has said to me that uh, no, that doesn't apply. But the Holy Spirit has said to me, no, you do it this other way. Now listen very carefully to this idea. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. All right? Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 14 and 15, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will lead you into all truth. By the statement of our Lord Jesus, the Bible is the word of truth, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Now, the bottom line, as we come to the end of the logic here, the Bible, the word of truth, and the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, will always be in harmony. You see? The Holy Bible and the Holy Spirit will always say the same thing. A Bible came to us from the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Do you remember? And so they will always be in agreement. And if someone says, well, I know that the Bible says Saturday is the Sabbath, but the Holy Spirit has told me to do it otherwise, I sometimes say to those folks, if I don't verbalize, I certainly am thinking it. No, the wrong spirit's been talking to you. Not God's spirit, the wrong spirit has been talking to you. Now, in the Bible, there are several names that are simply translated as God. There is Elohim, there is Adonai, there is Jehovah, and there are others, all simply translated as God. Among those names, there is one that is considered by the Bible writer and by the children of God early on in the Old Testament times to be so holy that it ought not to even be verbalized, and that is the name Jehovah. The name Jehovah is in its origin only just four letters without any vowels, Y-H-W-H, Y-H-W-H. And theologians and Bible teachers refer to that today as the tetragrammaton, four letters, Y-H-W-H. So that we could say it in word form, we have added the vowels, E and A and so forth. O, Jehovah. Now, the name Jehovah that is translated as God was used almost exclusively to show the eternal nature of God. At the burning bush, Moses asked, Who are you? And the voice came back, I am. I am. That means that God has always existed. Way back before recorded history, ever before there was mankind on planet Earth, there was God. Today, God is on the throne, the God family. And as long as there shall be eternity, there shall always be God. Now, I must be honest to say to you that when I was a child or a young teenager, that idea of God's being there forever and away before, I mean, my mind sort of got lost in it. The longer I live, the more sense eternity makes, especially in the future. It's going to take an eternity to do all of the fun things that God has planned for us, isn't it now? But here is what I'm moving toward now. Jehovah, the eternal nature of God. There have been those who have built whole churches around the idea that Jesus is not eternal, that Jesus is created. And they will take that passage where it says, John 3, 16, that he is the only begotten. Uh -huh. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. And they'll take that and build a theology around it. 
In the original, the word begotten did not carry the idea of one who was born or created for that matter, but rather it meant one who is unique, one like whom there is no other. And that's what it says about Jesus. There was never another like him. God sent his unique son, not that he was born, not that he was created, for Jesus Christ is eternal. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God. <clears throat> and at the burning bush, God said to Moses, I am. Who are you as Moses? I am. I always have been, I am today, I always shall be. I am eternal. I am Jehovah. Now, let's flash forward to the ministry of Jesus. Folks would ask him, who are you? And Jesus would respond with an answer that almost without exception included two words, I am, I am, I am. Am. And every time he said that, he was claiming to be eternal Jehovah God. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the bread. I am. I am. I am. You see, before Abraham was, I am eternal Jehovah God. Now, if someone should come to you and say to you, I don't believe that Jesus Christ is eternal God. I don't believe that he is Jehovah. You might respond like oftentimes I do, and you might then say, then you're in real trouble. You're in real trouble if Jesus Christ is not eternal Jehovah God. And when folks come knocking on my door, I want to come in and study the Bible with me. This is often where I will begin because it is essential. It is the primary building block, as far as I'm concerned, of the Christian faith and of the plan of salvation.